Today's topic, ladies and gentlemen, bad teachers. What do you do when you get a bad teacher? Now, specifically, as a saxophone player making this video, I want to talk about bad sax teachers, but in general, just a bad teacher for whatever subject that you're taking. I can distinctly remember two teachers that I really, really did not like. One was a Spanish teacher from high school, and the other one was a history, music history teacher from college. So let me tell you this story. When I was in high school, it was grades 10, 11, 12. So I took uh, Spanish one as a freshman in junior high, came to high school, Spanish two. After that, I did really well. So I took Spanish three, made National Spanish Honor Society. I know a lot of you have been asking me to do some videos in Spanish and I'm still working that out, but it'll make more sense after I tell this story. I, uh, I get to Spanish National Honor Society and I'm in the advanced Spanish class. Spanish three and four was basically the same class. So uh, I get this teacher and from day one, I'm just like, okay, this is intriguing because this is the first time someone's actually speaking Spanish. And I'm just like, my other teacher spoke Spanish, but it was more like learning vocabulary, translating, conjugating verbs and this kind of thing. But this guy is actually speaking Spanish. Spoiler alert, I don't like the guy because he's speaking Spanish. <laughs> so is that enough for me to label this person as a bad teacher? No. Now, a lot of these kids, even though we were all in the advanced class, man, they were way above where I was at. Now, the worst way you can possibly learn a language is to do it in isolation. So none of the other kids in the other classes that I was in was really that motivated about Spanish. So we didn't just sit around speaking Spanish to each other. It was a class I took that I was good at. This class was much more performance oriented. And this guy would just speak Spanish and I would be lost, man. I mean, I was like, he would even tell us the homework assignments in Spanish. So I didn't even know what the homework assignment was. I'd have to ask other kids and they'd be like trying to be funny and say it in Spanish. And I'm just like, I'm working my butt off and I'm just, I'm struggling big time. I'm getting like, you know, C minuses and D's and whatnot. Now in the U.S., we have these student teachers that come. They're in college. They do some student teaching. It's like field training. And then they go back, graduate, and then they're ready for the job. And we got this lady, bless her, this beautiful woman. She was the right kind of teacher that I needed because the other teacher, he would just speak Spanish. And he would always try and say it in such a way that you couldn't understand him, you know. Now, some of these other kids, he had his favorites. They were just those little brown nose and stuck up. Like, I, I really, really did not like this class. I didn't want to speak Spanish anymore. And I really didn't like this teacher or his weird fake toupee. <laughs> but we get the student teacher that comes in and she is just wonderful because she immediately understands how I'm going to learn. So she say something in Spanish, I give her one of these, she'd say it in English, then she'd say it in Spanish. And then I would answer her in Spanish because I finally understood what she was talking about. Now, as a person who basically learns Spanish in isolation, I'm very good at actually speaking the language. I'm just really bad at understanding it, even to this day. It's just like, <laughs> after having worked on cruise ships for 21 years, you wind up with a lot of native Spanish speakers. And there's usually this kind of grace period, unless I'm dating some girl or hanging out with a bunch of people that speak Spanish often, then it just starts to pick up. But in high school at this time, it just wasn't happening. We get the student teacher that comes on. She's not playing favorites to any of the students. And I just take off. She was a big reason why I was able to wind, finally wind up doing as well as I did in that class. Now, is it enough for me to say that that first teacher was a bad teacher? Well, when he came back, there was an overlap with both of them and he could see that I was really picking this stuff up. And the guy just had a funny way about him. Really, I to this day, I just, mm, ah, not that guy. But it's not really fair for me to say he was a bad teacher 
because he spoke Spanish in Spanish class. That's ridiculous. So in some part, you got to think about how are these other kids responding to this teacher? And they loved him and they learned a lot. It just did not work out for me like that. So although he was a good teacher, he was a bad teacher for me. When I got to college, I wound up with this history teacher and this dude just creeped me out from day one. I got this uh, Western art music history teacher. I was taking Western art music history two and I failed it. And let me tell you this real quick. So this dude creeps me out from day one. He's one of these like, he's got these goofy sandals that he wears and it's like minus 15 degrees outside and he's wearing these goofy sandals and it's like, I don't know, it's a real creepy looking get up to me. Again, the other students loved this guy. They excelled very much, man. They, they did really well. And I just wasn't learning anything, man. I'm just like, how do you guys even know what's going to be on the test? You know, it's just all this information randomly throughout all this stuff. And you know what? I wound up failing. And you know what? I went and actually talked to this dude. I was like, look, man, something about you just rubs me the wrong way. And it's probably all in my head. So at least I had the decency to acknowledge that it probably wasn't him, but whatever is going on, this isn't working for me, you know? And he was like, look, I've been following you around. I know you're a jazz major. There's no way I could ever be able to do what you're doing. I know what this history class represents and what you need to do in order to get your degree, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, look, just do this final assignment. If it's good enough. You're going to pass, you know? And I was just like, I didn't learn anything as a performance major for me to take a class and not learn anything is useless. I can't just take a theory class, pass and not understand theory, you know? So he gave me the option of passing this class without learning anything or failing it. And I was just like, I'm just going to take the F I'll take it again and try to learn something next time. Same thing happens. I take this class again from a different teacher and I almost ace it. So was that guy a bad teacher? No. Was he a bad teacher for me? Yeah, he was a horrible teacher for me. But I didn't go out and call him a bad teacher. I did actually confront him about his style of teaching and how I was struggling with it. And he gave me options. So it's not enough for us as students who clearly are seeking to gain knowledge for us to pass judgment on people who have the knowledge. Now, I mean, unless the teacher is just wildly inappropriate and if all the students are failing, now that's a different issue. But when it comes to teaching, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I wanna get out of this? And usually when it comes to college and high school and that kind of stuff, you're kind of locked in, you don't really have very many options as for what teacher you can choose. Even though in college, that did open up a bit. When it comes to music and saxophone playing, taking lessons, you absolutely can determine who it is that you wanna learn from. Lay out a plan. It's like, like, this is the kind of music I like. These are the kind of things that a teacher should be asking you anyway. These are the things that I'm into. This is what I wanna get out of playing an instrument like this. What you got for? I come from Canton, Ohio, which is the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They have like this big parade, not this year, but this big parade right before the first NFL game at the Hall of Fame. Before that, they'd have this mini parade and little kids get to march in it and stuff like that. For the summers, when I was in college, I used to work this summer band program. I was a saxophone teacher and I had roughly around 40 students every summer for six weeks, basically to keep these kids going over the summertime so that way they don't just completely fall off have to start over when the school season comes back i don't usually name drop on any of this kind of stuff i'd rather you just judge these videos for whatever you think they're worth but one of those kids is actually a saxophone player with earth wind and fire right now so keith mckelly it's my man all right i learned a lot from teaching these kids and just basically how people learn being able to adjust the lessons to basically keep these kids interested. For me, the most important thing 
was to do to these kids what my teacher did to me, which was make it fun and make it interesting, make it to where it's something that I want to keep doing. So, you know, I had my own personal Mr. Miyagi when it comes to playing saxophone, and I want to pass that on to the next generation. And even you guys on YouTube that are watching this stuff, I mean, we got to keep our thing going. Otherwise, people won't want to do this anymore. You know what I'm saying? So let me leave you guys with this because I'm a huge fan of Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, my man. <laughs> Let's use an example of a dog, specifically a puppy. A puppy can learn its name and learn a command in 10 minutes. You can teach a dog its name in 10 minutes. How is it possible that an animal like a dog can learn its name when no other dog on the planet can teach it its name. No other dog on the planet can give it a name. No other dog that has ever existed is capable of giving this dog a name. The dog cannot teach another dog what its own name is. This to me greatly implies that a dog's capacity for knowledge is far greater than the collective knowledge of its entire species ever. The collective knowledge of its entire species that has ever existed. No dog in the history of dogs has ever been able to teach another dog, hey, your name is Fido. So once the human passes this information down to the dog, that information stops right there. And if you think about one of the greatest assets that human beings have in terms of being creatures of planet Earth, it's our ability to be able to disseminate information from one human being to the next and to the next and to the next. You think about how smart the smartest primate is. Probably Coco the gorilla. Apparently this animal knew something like 2,000 words and could sign like over a thousand of them, could even construct sentences. Coco didn't know the word for ring, but Coco knew the word for finger and bracelet. So this animal signed finger bracelet to mean ring, which is crazy. But at no point have I ever heard of Coco being able to teach another gorilla. So there's this theory about chimpanzees being our closest relative and it's something like a one percent genetic difference and somewhere in that one percent is the difference between putting people on the moon and writing symphonies versus you know reaching around and throwing poop at the screen <laughs> right and then you think okay well what if there's an alien somewhere in outer space that comes to earth and is that one percent more advanced than the human being what would they be able to teach us they'd probably be able to teach us perfect pitch in 10 minutes but we cannot teach one another perfect pitch, if at all, but for damn sure not in 10 minutes. You know, that's the equivalent of me not being able to teach somebody else perfect pitch, but an alien with that extra 1% could be able to teach me perfect pitch in 10 minutes. And then it's locked and I know it, but I wouldn't be able to pass that information on to other people. So my theory is this, what if somewhere in that 1% is an intelligence difference that's actually far less than 1% that actually separates a human being's level of intelligence from a chimpanzee or some other primate. And what if that 1% actually exists amongst other people, but we're not actively pursuing, trying to reach and dig in for that 1%? What if we lose our ability to disseminate information from one person to another? I try to construct these lessons in such a way that when I show you this, you should be able to understand it and then pass that knowledge on to someone else. And they should be able to understand it and pass it on to someone else. Now, some of it just requires an extra bit of effort to figure it out. But once you figure it out, it's like, I can pass this on now. Because if Isaac Newton couldn't pass this information down, where would we all be? If Albert Einstein couldn't pass his theories down, where would we be? If quantum theory couldn't be passed down from its founders, 
I definitely wouldn't have the technology to be able to pass on information that I'm doing right now. When it comes to a bad teacher or a good teacher, it really just boils down to this. How well can I pass on the information that's been given to me? If I'm not getting it, if I don't understand it on a level like that, then I'm clearly not understanding it. And maybe it is time to find a different teacher or maybe it's time to adjust how you're learning. So I hope I'm able to give you guys a different perspective on what you should be expecting from being taught. Or maybe if you're an educator, you're a teacher, how you should be thinking about disseminating information amongst people and how well people can understand this stuff. Because this is the method that I'm thinking in my head is how well can somebody learn this and teach somebody else and that person someone else and someone else. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I got for you. Stay tuned. See ya.